I am a professional aerospace engineer. Um, I don't have very much experience, honestly. I got my graduate degree last year. So, uh, and now I am working on the uh, Cygnus program, which is a uh, supply ship that goes to the International Space Station on contract with NASA. It is a pretty cool job, I'm not gonna lie. Um, and I also am a huge nerd, as you might expect, and I like science fiction uh, and sci-fi video games, especially. Um, and I'm really into uh, space simulators, like space combat simulators. Um, so these have a pretty long and cool history. Um, anyone ever play either of these games? Uh, Elite, uh, yeah, Elite was like the first one. Um, Wing Commander really got like the, the cinematic feel, trying to bring Star Wars in, into the PC gaming world. Um, yeah. Uh, I've actually never played <laughs> either of these. Uh, I'm a little bit young for that. Um, but and I mentioned Star Wars. Star Wars got a, a share of uh, space combat video games. Um, now, I have played Free Space 2. Some people consider this to be the best space combat game of all time. Uh, I am a big fan. Uh, and we've got newer games. We kind of had a renaissance recently of games uh, like <laughs> Elite Dangerous. <laughs> Um, I, I play the crap out of Elite Dangerous. Uh, that's pretty cool. And uh, one I'm really excited for, Star Citizen, Mark Hamill, coming back to Space Sims. He was great in Star Wars, so I can't wait to see him in Squadron 42. Um, now, all these Space Sims, have, they've kind of settled on a similar paradigm. Um, this very cinematic idea of like, you know, you got your wingmen and your, your space fighters, and you've got to get on the enemy's tail, um, get your missile locks, get into, you know, guns range uh, with your lasers and whatever. Um, all of this is, is a really big lie, <laughs> because this is not space combat. This is World War I air combat without gravity. So, uh, I like this picture to represent it because we've got an airship in the background. Those capital ships in those video games are just kind of sitting there like airships. They're not actually that big of a threat. Um, and then, yeah, the idea of having to get on someone's tail and the fact that you can't turn around easily. I mean, there's no gravity in space. You could just flip around any direction you want. And there's obviously a good reason for this because we want video games to be fun. Um, and, well, space combat might not be that fun, <laughs> at least not in this way, but we'll get to that. So, um, I haven't gotten a chance to test the audio, so let's hope this works. This recruits is a 20 kilo ferrous slug. Feel the weight! Every five seconds, the main gun of an Everest-class dreadnought accelerates 1 to 1.3% of light speed. It impacts with the force of a 38 kiloton bomb. That is three times the yield of the city buster dropped on Hiroshima back on Earth. That means Sir Isaac Newton is the deadliest son of a bitch in space. Title now, five. Serviceman Burnside, what is Newton's first law? Sir, an object in motion stays in motion, sir. No credit for partial answers, maggot. Sir, unless acted on by an outside force, sir. Damn straight! I dare to assume you ignorant jackasses know that space is empty. Once you fire this hunk of metal, it keeps going till it hits something. That can be a ship, or the planet behind that ship. It might go off into deep space and hit somebody else in 10,000 years. If you pull the trigger on this, you are ruining someone's day, somewhere and sometime. That is why you check your damn targets. That is why you wait for the computer to give you a damn firing solution. That is why, serviceman Chung, we do not eyeball it. This is a weapon of mass destruction. You are not a cowboy shooting from the hip. Sir, yes, sir. All right, so I love Mass Effect 2 and the whole series. Uh, I haven't played Andromeda, but the original trilogy, loved it. Uh, it, is, it is the softest, squishiest sci-fi. It is not realistic at all. Um, but I love this scene. And so at least, you know, they're acknowledging this idea that, yeah, if you get something going fast enough, that that's going to have a lot of energy, that's going to do a lot of damage. Um, and it also, 
it inspired the title of this panel and gives us a good candidate for who is the deadliest son of a bitch in space. Um, <laughs> Isaac Newton is pretty deadly, as we've learned. Um, ah, it's getting cut off there, but uh, he's also a son of a bitch. Um, if you know a little bit about Newton, he was a quite a character. Um, but there are other contenders. So we might learn a little bit about them later. Um, and of course, one of Isaac Newton's great contributions to physics and science, his laws. Uh, first one we saw in the video, object in motion remains in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Um, and, okay, I think, I think we understand that one. <laughs> uh, number two, acceleration is proportional to force is in the same direction as the applied force. And we can write this as an equation, F equals MA. Uh, and that is kind of the basics of all physics. Uh, <laughs> and three, when an object applies a force to a second object, the second object applies a simultaneous and equal force upon the first in the opposite direction. This is a little bit of a clear way of writing the equal and opposite forces uh, law, which you may have heard. Um, now, Newton wasn't done coming up with laws. There's actually another important law. Uh, he had to invent calculus first. So Newton goes and invents calculus uh, and figures out uh, how planets move. And I mean, Kepler had come up with uh, that he knew planets were moving in an elliptical orbit, but they didn't bother to find out why that was the case. And Newton actually came up with uh, this equation which describes how gravity works. Um, so what it's describing here is it's saying the force of gravity is equal to this gravitational constant, which is this really small number. Uh, and then you've got the mass of like the planet or the star or the asteroid, um, some, usually something really big, and then the mass of another thing like um, another planet or a spaceship or uh, a whale or something. Uh, and then the distance between the things. Um, now, <laughs> Earth is about one sextillion times more massive than a person. Uh, so the force, yeah, the, it, the Earth's gonna just dominate gravity. Um, you know, this slide seemed like a good idea when I made it, but this is a lot of math. <laughs> so I'll just go through this quickly. Um, you can rearrange the equation and, and it will show that any object on Earth or any object around a body that has an appreciable amount of gravity, um, well, around any body, but it only really matters for really big things, uh, is they're all going to have the same acceleration. Um, and this is demonstrated with the you know, hammer and well, a feather thought experiment. Well, my left hand, experiment. I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Yeah, how about that? Um, yeah. So everything's uh, accelerating down towards the Earth at the same rate. Um, but Donald, if I drop a feather on Earth, it doesn't drop as fast as okay, the hammer. Okay, that's, that's air resistance. Oh. Uh, in, yeah. <laughs> See, this is why I became an aerospace engineer, is because when you bring air, air resistance into it, everything gets really complicated. And so in school, they're asking, hey, do you want to work on airplanes or spacecraft? It's like, well, which one can I do? Which, in which one do I not have to deal with aerodynamics? <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, 
That is why I'm a spacecraft engineer. <laughs> um, but the interesting with, thing with the acceleration, so we can think about, well, if we're accelerating towards the Earth, but if we change our frame of reference and lock it on us, that's kind of equivalent to the Earth accelerating up towards us. So now imagine us on a spaceship, and the spaceship is accelerating. So this is all acceleration, so you know, once we get to that point, um, a spaceship accelerating towards us is, like, is kind of like when we're standing on the Earth. I mean, this is why when you're in your car, you hit the accelerator pedal, you get pushed back into the seat. Uh, it's kind of the same thing that's happening as, as with gravity, you know, when you're getting pushed in your chair sitting on the Earth. Um, so this brings up our first uh, problem with sci-fi spaceship design. Uh, so I've got the Normandy here as an example. Uh, and all the decks on the Normandy are laid out like this, along the long ways of the ship. Uh, so that means when this ship accelerates, uh, everything in it is going to go flying to the back. <laughs> and there's, the solution to this was known a long time ago. This is from Tintin, Explorers on the Moon. Uh, they published this in 1954, so that's before we landed on the moon, for real. Um, and this is a classic rocket shape. And I feel like a lot of people see these kinds of things and think like, oh, how outdated, how, how quaint. And uh, the way this is designed, when the rocket accelerates in, up in this picture, in that direction, that's the way it travels, um, the decks are laid out like this. And so uh, the rocket accelerates, and you get pushed into the deck just like if there were gravity. Uh, okay, so now we're going to talk about orbits, moving around in space. So we, have, we know how gravity works. Uh, so we're going to do a little thought experiment. We're going to build a huge tower. Let's say it's a few hundred kilometers high, like 400 kilometers. It just happens to be how high the ISS orbits. Uh, we're going to stand up there on our giant tower. Uh, yeah, well, this is a magical thought experiment tower, and it does not collapse. Um, and we're, we're going to hold the baseball, and we're just going to drop this baseball off the tower. And so there is a, a range component in our equation describing gravity, but at 400 kilometers, the force of gravity is over 90% of what we feel on Earth. It, it falls off relatively slowly. And so when we drop this ball, it's just gonna, it's just gonna fall all the way down. Um, but what if we threw it? So we throw this ball, and it's got this nice arcing trajectory, and what you'll notice is that the ball has fallen farther, um, at least in the direction of down in this picture, because the Earth is curving away from it. So you can imagine if we throw this ball hard enough, uh, it will fall towards the Earth and miss. And that's all an orbit is. You're falling at the Earth and missing. Um, and because when you know when the ball falls, misses the Earth, OK, it's over there now. Well, gravity is pointing now to the right. So it keeps, it still has momentum in the downward direction of this picture, so it keeps falling that way, but now it's also going to be pulled in towards the center. And in that way, it travels around and around constantly. Um, all right, it's early in the morning, uh, so we're gonna do something fun to demonstrate this. So if I could ask everyone to please stand. Okay, so I'm going to count down from three, three, two, one, and then I'm going to say jump, and I want everyone to just jump in the air. Don't, don't, you don't have to jump really super high. Uh, I don't want anyone to get hurt. Okay, three, two, one, jump. Congratulations, you've just experienced weightlessness. Get your astronaut wings on the way out. <laughs> just kidding. 
I don't have any astronaut wings. But uh, as soon as your feet leave the ground, you are in free fall. Even if you're traveling upwards, your acceleration down towards the Earth is the same. Until you hit the floor, you stop accelerating. Um, and free fall is what astronauts experience when they are in orbit, because they are constantly falling at the planet and missing. Um, and since everything accelerates toward the Earth at the same rate, uh, if, if I'm holding an object and I'm in orbit and free fall, I let go, it's going to fall with me and appear to be floating in the air. Uh, so sometimes the term zero gravity gets tossed around. That's not correct. Uh, weightlessness is technically correct because you don't have weight, it's because weight is the force. Uh, gravity, or yeah. <laughs> it, weight is when you, the floor stops you, pushes up on you. Um, zero G is, an, is a term we use, but the G is not short for gravity, it's short for G force. Um, because when you are in free fall, uh, you have no uh, force on you. <laughs> or you, do, you don't feel any force, the force of gravity is still pulling on you. Okay, so, back to orbits. Uh, we define orbits by the distance from the center of the body we're orbiting and our velocity around that body. Uh, there's other ways we can define orbits, uh, but this is the basic one. And if we want to change our orbit, we have to change uh, one of those things. And we can't just arbitrarily change our position, uh, so we change how fast we're going. So if we're in a nice circular orbit around our planet like this, and we speed up, our orbit is going to change like this. Um, now, all orbits are ellipses, and an ellipse has two uh, foci, focus is, <laughs> and the body that we're orbiting is always at one of the foci, our focuses. <laughs> and um, the point in the orbit where we are closest to the body we're orbiting, we call the periapsis, and uh, farthest away, the apoapsis. I always think of apex, like if you're at the top of a mountain, you're at the apex, you're farther away from the Earth, apoapsis. Um, and uh, a circle is actually a special kind of ellipse where uh, both of the focuses are at the same point. So if we keep speeding up, our ellipse uh, keeps getting more eccentric. Uh, and eventually, we will gain enough speed where we reach escape velocity. And uh, our orbit turns into a hyperbola or a parabola. These are all conic sections. You don't really need to know that. Um, the important part is that orbits are ellipses. And there's an interesting property of elliptical orbits. So uh, we've got two spaceships here starting at the same point. And one of them is going to do our circular orbit, and one of them is going to do our elliptical orbit. And uh, as they travel, there's a law here. Uh, not a Newton law, but uh, Kepler's law, Kepler's second law, that says as uh, an orbit is traced out in time, for each unit time, uh, you, it, your orbit sweeps out the same area. So what I mean here is uh, in some amount of time, the blue ship will sweep out this wedge here. And then some amount of time later, it will sweep out a wedge, or I should say the same amount of block, time block later. So uh, it, it will sweep out 
another edge with equal area. Where, where this gets interesting is when you have an elliptical orbit. Um, this orange spaceship will start move, it will be moving very quickly here and sweep out a wedge like this. But then as the, as the ellipse chunks get kind of longer in this direction, it will actually be moving slower because it is sweeping out chunks of the same area as this one. But again, they're getting longer. Um, and if you remember uh, how we got to this elliptical orbit, we sped up. So what that means is speeding up here has slowed us down over here. So The, yeah, so basically in an orbit, if you speed up, uh, you slow down. <laughs> it, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. But how, ca how can we use this to get around? Well, it, if we're in one orbit, we wanna get, let's say we wanna get to a bigger orbit. We wanna get to a higher altitude. So uh, the first thing we do, speed up here. Okay, so that elongates our orbit. When we get around to here, uh, we will speed up again. So that will make our orbit longer in the, on the other side. Uh, and if we circularize it, if we make it so now we are in another circular orbit, um, we're at higher altitude. We're in another circular orbit at a higher altitude. And, and moving orbits like this uh, is called a Hohmann transfer. Uh, came up with Walter Hohmann, and he was not a physicist or an engineer by trade. Uh, he did this in his spare time. <laughs> and we can use Hohmann's transfers to get to other bodies, too. So uh, we're in the Earth-Moon system here. Uh, we speed up, and we make our orbit so it encircles the moon. And we travel over there. This time we're going to slow down, so our velocity... Uh, we, we turn our spaceship around and fire our engines in the other direction, slow down, and start orbiting the moon. Um, of course, I've been talking about speeding up and slowing down. How do we do that in space? It's like, well, we're gonna take advantage of Newton's laws again. Uh, if we've got something like that baseball from earlier and we throw it, because of Newton's third law, we have an equal and opposite force. Uh, us throwing that ball, it is going to put an e equal force back on us. Now, of course, we're heavier than the ball, so we're, we're not gonna get as much velocity. Um, but we do get some velocity, and so this is how we can move around in space, because we don't have anything else to push on. Uh, of course, just like having individual objects and throwing them isn't very efficient, so we usually, we take a fluid, uh, a propellant, and you can imagine this like having, you know, millions and millions and millions of tiny little baseballs, uh, and then we throw them constantly out the back of a spaceship with an engine. So, uh, we've got a propellant, not a, not a fuel, but uh, a propellant. Uh, we've got an engine, uh, we exhaust, we, we uh, are propellant at some velocity. Uh, if you remember, you know, F equals MA, uh, we get a force. And we call that force thrust. Um, now, if you think about this, well, the equal and opposite forces, force of the propellant that we exert on the propellant is force on the spaceship, but F equals MA. So this is all going to depend on the mass of our propellant. Um, how much we can move that propellant, how fast we can move it. It's also gonna depend on the mass of our spaceship. And the thing is, we're carrying all that propellant with us. It's part of the mass of our spaceship. So as we get rid of propellant, our spaceship's getting lighter. Um, so our acceleration is going to change and it's going to do so constantly. Um, and so to figure out how to deal with this, 
we've got the rocket equation. And it, you know, being called the rocket equation might give you an idea of how important this is to rocketry and aerospace engineering. And this uh, was coming, uh, it was credited to Tsiolkovsky, uh, a uh, Russian physicist. And what this is saying is we actually measure our, the performance of our space vehicle with delta V. This is how much we can change velocity. Since every maneuver we do, it takes a certain velocity. Um, we want to know how many maneuvers we can do. So we want to know the total delta V that we can perform. Um, now, this is a little weird. We measure the performance of our engine in seconds. We call this specific impulse. And then we multiply that by Earth's gravity. Um, this is really weird. Even engineers don't really know why we do this. Uh, this it, when you multiply these together, what you actually end up with is the exhaust velocity of whatever your propulsion system is. So this is how fast it can take that propellant and shoot it out the back. Um, uh, this is a natural log. Uh, it, mathematical operation. Uh, and then we have our mass ratio. So M0 is the starting mass of our spaceship. Uh, that's with all of the propellant on board. Um, and then MF is the final mass. That's after we exhaust all of our propellant. Uh, how much does the whole system weigh? Now that natural log, um, what it means is that it's, as we increase that mass ratio, we keep adding more and more propellant to our spaceship, uh, we get diminishing returns. Uh, and this really sucks. And I like to call it the tyranny of the rocket equation. And I'm sorry that it got cut off. <laughs> but, uh, this really sucks because if this were even linear, we could just keep adding fuel to our spaceship and go farther and farther. Um, but what this means is the more delta V we want, um, the amount of fuel we need to add to get you know, just a little bit more delta V uh, or even a, a little bit more payload mass uh, is just gonna keep going up and up and up. And this is why rockets are mostly fuel by a lot, uh, like more than 90% of a rocket is fuel. Uh, this is a Saturn V, and the blue highlighted areas, those are all fuel tanks, or propellant tanks. The Saturn V, it's, it's fuel and propellant. Get to that in a moment. Um, so yeah, the, our other option then is to, if we want higher performance, um, we have to increase the specific impulse of our rocket engine, and that's not trivial. Um, but that will bring us to another important figure in aerospace engineering, Robert Goddard. Uh, and he came up with what is by far the most common method of propelling uh, space vehicles today, uh, and that would be a uh, bipropellant rocket system. Um, I don't believe he invented it himself, but he built what's considered to be the, the first uh, bipropellant rocket. So we've got a fuel. Um, you could just use something like gasoline, but we also use uh, more exotic things like hydrogen, uh, or there's some really toxic propellants we can use, um, which have their own advantages. Uh, we need to combine that with oxygen, because pretty much everything to, to, in order to burn needs oxygen. And, well, there isn't any in space. Um, and then what we're going to do is pump that into our engine and ignite it. And when that fuel ignites, it generates a lot of heat, and we get exhaust gases, and those gases expand. And we can uh, take advantage of that expansion. We can use it to do work and use it to accelerate those uh, exhaust gases, and that will act as our propellant. And so in a bipropellant, or a, any chemical rocket, really, your fuel and propellant are the same. 
And that's where our, some of the confusion comes in um, when we're talking about fuel versus propellant. But we'll see later that that's not always the case. Uh, now, I've called out the pumps here because we need to get this fuel in there really fast. If we want a lot of performance, uh, we need to pump fuel really, really quickly. And um, I mean, we're talking we need performance uh, better than sports cars. And so what most rockets do these days is they have gas turbines. They are tapping fuel off of the main propellant lines and burning it just to run these turbines. And uh, as an example of how high performance these things, the space shuttle main engine uh, has turbine blades that are the size of someone's little finger. And each one of these blades is putting out something like 500 horsepower. And there are many, many of these blades on the turbine. Uh, so just absolute ridiculous performance. Uh, but even, even at that level of performance, um, well, we can't do anything like this. Cars, fold in. We're going upstairs. So this is from Call of Duty Infinite Warfare, and I'm going to make fun of it. Go flight. I actually really like the sound design. Okay, so our intrepid heroes are boosting in the orbit to fight Martians or something. And you can see altitude going up, uh, speed going up. I didn't, I didn't actually check to see if those speeds were realistic. I did. Okay. So they're burning out at like 250 kilometers, which is lower than the Get International Space the Station. Oh, sure. I've got to point something out. Uh, over to the right, let me get my laser pointer here. Over here, that says three Gs and his engine's just burned out. He should be in free fall in zero G. Come on, guys. <laughs> All right. Let's, Let's get in there. Okay. Oh, and you might have noticed just a second earlier, their fighters deployed wings in space. Um. All right, explosions. Michael Bay would be proud. Okay, we've got these capital ships here. They're just hanging out. They're just sitting there. I don't know what they're doing. They're just. I mean, this isn't this isn't World War One air combat. Those capital ships are back in the Napoleonic age. Um, and then when, when the space fighter points directly at those enemy ships and boosts toward them, like we talked about earlier, that's not how orbits work, right? If you, if you can imagine, if, if they're in the same orbit and the hero space fighter is chasing the enemy and he boosts forward, I mean, remember when that orbit gets longer, he's going to slow down. So the, those enemies are actually going to get farther away from him. And so the way you, you would actually want to catch up to uh, someone like this, um, you might turn the butt of your spacecraft toward them and fire your engines in the opposite direction. That will make your orbit smaller. And so you, when you get halfway around the Earth, um, you will be going faster. Um, but what I want to talk about right now is the <laughs> raw, ridiculous performance of this vehicle. So the, the fighter that the character was in in that clip was called the Jackal. And it's a space fighter. It, it can do everything. It flies in space. It flies on other planets. It flies on Earth. Um, I'm going to compare it to an F-22 Raptor. Uh, they, they actually look pretty similar. So, okay, in order to get to low Earth orbit, you need about 9.4 kilometers per second of delta V. So that accounts for uh, getting off the surface of the Earth, getting enough speed so you get into that orbit, uh, and also the atmospheric effects, because we do have to deal with the atmosphere. So I know I said earlier, I didn't want to deal with atmospheres, aerospace engineer, well, even spaceships have to deal with it. 
Um, and so an F-22 fighter is about 19,700 kilograms dry. So that's with no fuel. Um, and our performance uh, of a liquid hydrogen and oxygen rocket, uh, which is about the highest performance rocket engine we can build right now. That's 450 seconds of ISP. Um, if you do the math out, the mass ratio ends up being 8.4. So you need about 8.4 times the F-22's mass in fuel in order to get it into orbit. Um, that's 145,870 kilograms. And an F-22 with external drop tanks has 11,900 kilograms. Um, so just trying to bolt that much <laughs> extra fuel to an F-22, it, it's just ridiculous. Um, but we can't actually do better. We can't actually do better. And we're, we're going to introduce someone extremely dangerous, and you probably know him, uh, Einstein. And so uh, Einstein's most famous work, E equals MC squared, eventually leads us to the development of nuclear power. And when in doubt, go nuclear. Because, I mean, yeah. Um, remember earlier when I was talking about com when you combust your oxygen and your fuel and it generates heat. Well, we're just going to skip the combustion and generate heat with a nuclear reactor. So we can take propellant, uh, hydrogen is a good option, um, and we just feed it through our nuclear reactor. It's going to get really, really hot. It's going to expand uh, and blast out of our engine. Um, we're going to get eight, about 850 seconds ISP. Uh, it's about double. That's pretty good. And with this, our mass ratio to launch that F-22 goes down to 3.1. Um, so that's better. <laughs> the craziest part about this, uh, we actually built one of these at one point. Uh, it's cut off, but this is the, the Phoebus 2A nuclear rocket engine. Um, it was tested at Los Alamos. It actually worked. Uh, NASA was ready to use this, but in the budget crunch after Apollo and, you know, the Cold War threat of nuclear annihilation, um, they didn't think people would like the idea of having nuclear engines in space. So uh, the project was canned. Now, what actually limits the performance of a, your nuclear rocket engine is uh, your nuclear fuel rods. You have like uranium uh, or something like that, maybe plutonium, probably uranium. But uh, those rods, if they get too hot, they'll melt. So that's what's limiting your performance, because you want as much heat as you can get. Um, but then someone asks, what's the problem if they melt? In fact, what's the problem if they turn into a gas? If you can get your nuclear engine so hot that your nuclear fuel uh, is gaseous, you can get more performance. And so this is an uh, engine concept called the nuclear light bulb. Uh, and it's called a light bulb because you have quartz uh, tubes, quartz bulbs filled with gaseous nuclear fuel. Um, and, you, you know, this can get your ISP up to the point where actually that, that Call of Duty spaceship, if it had a nuclear light bulb engine, might be able to get to orbit. But then, of course, it would be out of propellant uh, and be a sitting duck in orbit. Um, now, this is, a, this is called a closed cycle. Uh, nuclear engine because we're we're keeping all of our nuclear fuel uh, but you can also do an open cycle nuclear uh, gas core nuclear engine you just feed in your nuclear fuel um, it gets nice and hot it melts into a gas and it just gets expelled along with the rest of your propellant so you've got uh, your nuclear rocket streaking across the sky radiating everything um, you do get higher performance out of that um, and, it, and if this isn't cool enough or hot enough, uh, you could go to fusion power. And um, 
Yeah, so with this one, we're using giant banks of lasers to pulverize our nuclear fuel pellets uh, and, and getting them to fuse and release tons of energy. And I, I want to point out how huge this concept is for a, uh, a fusion rocket. Um, you'll see at the top, it's calling out crew modules and landers. <laughs> Yeah, so this, this, is not, this is not like Saturn V scale. This is like, um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's pretty big. Um, of course, there is an easier way to do fusion and fission. This was nuclear bombs, and uh, we're pretty good at this already. And, uh, well, someone said, hey, why don't we use that to propel our spacecraft? Um, so this is Project Orion. The way this works, you carry a bunch of nuclear bombs. Oh, not just nuclear bombs, nuclear-shaped charges. So we're actually directing our nuclear energy in one direction because we don't want to waste it. We don't want to waste all of that precious nuclear energy. Um, and we've got our spaceship, and on the back of our spaceship is a, a giant uh, pusher plate with shock absorbers on it. We have two stages of shock absorbers. And we're going to send these nuclear bombs out the back of a spaceship. They're going to be pointing at us. Uh, we detonate the nuclear bombs, and all of that energy slams in that pusher place and pushes us forward. And the shock absorbers are so we don't get creamed. Um, because the acceleration would be so high, we'd just get flattened. <laughs> So with the shock absorbers, we can even out that acceleration a little bit. This is, this is actually incredibly high performance. Like, if you do the math on this, it actually work really well. And they did research on this. Um, you can find video online, I'm kind of wishing I put it in here now, of a test uh, vehicle, maybe this big around. They're not using nukes, they're using C4. They're dropping bombs out the back of it, and it's launching itself up into the air. Uh, and they're actually able to control this thing. Um, yeah, and uh, you might have realized by now that this is all pretty dangerous, uh, which leads us to John's Law of Sci-Fi. Any interesting space drive is a weapon of mass destruction. Um, and interesting is equal to whatever keeps the readers from getting bored. <laughs> so. The, yeah, the one thing here, there's, there's actually two parts to this. One of it is just the raw power contained in the engine itself. Just the fact that we're sending out streams of you know, nuclear fuel and whatnot. Um, the other one is, is the faster we can go, the more damage we can do. If you think back to that Mass Effect video at the beginning, if, if you're accelerating anything fast enough, uh, it can do a lot of damage. And this is why, um, this is why we hate the EM drive, or the M drive, or whatever it is. If this thing actually works, which it probably doesn't, I hope it doesn't, because that means we need to rewrite physics, um, then you could just slap on a bunch of solar panels or a nuclear reactor just for power, uh, crank power into this thing, because it doesn't need propellant, and just wait. Yeah, if you need propellant, you need to keep getting more of it. You need to carry it with you, and you're subject to the rocket equation. In this one, you're not subject to the rocket equation. If you're willing to wait long enough, this thing will just go faster and faster and faster and faster, and then you can just slam it into a planet. Um, this really sucks. Uh, and the rule of thumb for that, an object impacting at three kilometers per second delivers kinetic energy equal to its mass in TNT. So if I've got a one kilometer slug, three kilometers per second, when it slams into something, that's about um, one kilogram of TNT. <laughs> so this is why asteroids coming from deep space and running into things is a big problem. <laughs> so yeah, uh, thanks for that, Newton. <laughs> And that lets us segue nicely into weapons. Uh, so we're going to start. They don't. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take questions at the end. 
Um, I want to make sure I can get through my material. But that is an interesting question. So, uh, weapons. We'll start from the basics. Um, just regular guns, regular old guns. Uh, if you've seen Firefly, there was this scene, and I was, I was happy and sad at the same time, because um, it was obvious the creators, the writers, were thinking about this problem, because I mentioned earlier, if we want to combust something, we need oxygen. So, oh, if, he want, if, if Jane Cobb wants to shoot Vera in space, he's going to have to put it uh, into a spacesuit. Well, actually, no. Um, because gunpowder actually contains an oxidizer. Uh, that's, it's part of what gives it its uh, performance. Um, and in fact, there have already been guns in space, at least one, because um, of course the Russians put a gun in space. Uh, <laughs> they, they, it was a modified aircraft machine gun which was installed on the Salyut 3 space station, and this was all classified until the collapse of the Soviet Union. We saw their documents. Um, uh, it was tested, test fired, reports vary of how many test firings were done, whether they fired it until it exhausted its ammo. But that's not really important. Um, but uh, it was fired remotely. There were no cosmonauts on board the station when they did this. Um, yeah, and this, this was back in the, scary days of the Cold War where they were actually expecting to have to fight in space, uh, which thankfully didn't happen. Um, of course, if you, if you want to stick with ballistic weapons, we've got much cooler ways of uh, accelerating projectiles, uh, like something we're working on now, the railgun. You may have heard of the Navy railgun uh, that they are testing. Um, and. The advantage of a railgun is it is much more powerful than uh, naval guns. So that's an Iowa-class battleship, 16-inch guns, and it can launch projectiles at 762 meters per second. And the prototype railgun uh, is going about 2,500 meters per second. So uh, pretty big performance. Uh, improvement and yeah yeah about 10 times more powerful uh, very very impressive um, now I'm a big fan of lasers because lasers are just cool so all what you're doing with a laser is you are creating a coherent light so white light has a lot of different uh, wavelengths within it. Um, so if we can isolate one wavelength and then make it coherent so all of those waves are traveling in the same direction, uh, we get a lot more power out of it. And the, the construction of a laser is actually pretty simple. We need a lasing medium. Uh, one example is like ruby. You could use a ruby crystal. Uh, you have a, a, what's called a pump source. So just something like a lamp, something really bright. And then we've got two mirrors here, so we're, we're flashing light in between these two mirrors. Uh, it's gonna bounce back and forth, um, and we're gonna get our coherent beam out one side. Um, now one thing that kind of disappoints me about sci-fi is lasers in like video games and media, um, they're, they don't actually look like what real lasers would look like. They're always these pointy things. Um, and I mean, maybe I, I should be blaming like ray guns of the 50s because they, they've got barrels that look like antenna. Um, but real lasers are actually going to be a lot like cameras. They're going to have huge uh, lenses and mirrors on them. Um, and I, I think this is cooler, actually. Uh, and, and these are other, um, these are combat lasers that uh, our military has built as well. Uh, on, the upper left, we've got the uh, airborne laser, which was an experiment to see, could we use this thing to shoot down missiles? Uh, and the bottom right um, is a, a recent one that the Navy's working on. Um, they're also gonna shoot down missiles. Uh, lasers are really good at shooting down missiles because, uh, well, light travels very quickly. <laughs> uh, now, most of the lasers uh, we build these days are either in the visible light range, so we've got a few different uh, frequencies of laser up there. Or, or we do infrared, 
Um, we use these a lot for uh, targeting systems, covert ops stuff. Uh, but it, it would be really great if we could like have an X-ray or a gamma ray laser, because you get a lot more uh, energy out of those, a lot more power. Um, the problem is generating X-rays and gamma rays. We can generate visible light, like in the, the laser diagram from earlier, uh, we have a flash lamp. Uh, so yeah, we could generate the visible light that way. Uh, we could generate infrared light. Um, ultraviolet, uh, good question. I, I, I do believe we have UV lasers. Um, but not X or gamma rays, uh, because we need a good source of X and gamma rays. And we do actually have one. <laughs> So, we build our laser, um, and we power it with a nuclear bomb. And we call this a nuclear pumped laser. And what, what's going on here is, is like, hold on a second, nuclear bomb, that would destroy your laser. Well, yes, but in the split second, before everything is vaporized, you would actually get a laser pulse. And this could be a... a great weapon uh, in space combat because space is empty, so well, we can set off nukes with fewer consequences. And uh, so if you want to use a nuke to power a laser, well, you don't want it on your ship, but you could put it on a missile and send it out, uh, detonate it, and you know get some extra range out of your missile. In, uh, and speaking of missiles, um, well, you know, Sci-fi, it's all speculative. And one of the big things with sci-fi is trying to come up with uh, what's going to be like the relative tech level of everything, what's going to be dominant. But it, it's a pretty easy case to be made for missiles being very dominant in space combat. Um, and that's because you can get the most range out of, out of these missiles because they're gonna have performance similar to your spaceships. So anywhere your uh, spaceships can go, your missiles can go. And as we learned earlier, all they need to be doing is going fast enough to, in order to do damage. Um, so sci-fi missiles are, you know, it seems like it's kind of hard to screw up a missile. Uh, it's got an engine on the back and a warhead on the front. Um, that Star Citizen one up there has fins. It doesn't really need fins, but I guess in Star Citizen you have atmospheric combat, so I'll let it slide. Uh, yeah, and that there's a. I mean, whether your vehicles are going to have the performance in order to fight in space and in the atmosphere in the first place is debatable. Uh, but. Um, I always imagine that space combat missiles are gonna look more like this, and we don't make missiles that look like that, because, well, in sci-fi, I mean, these look kind of boring. <laughs> but the, these are based on, uh, these are real missiles that we use. Um, these are extremely high-speed uh, missiles from the Cold War that we use to intercept incoming uh, nuclear uh, ICBMs. Um, so on the left is the Sprint missile, um, which accelerates at something like 100 G, so that's 100 times the acceleration of gravity. Yeah, absolutely ridiculous missile. So that, that might be similar to something that would be used in space combat. Um, now, I've only got a few minutes, but there's one more thing that I have to get to. Um, everything we've talked about so far, pr pretty much everything except for the missiles maybe, uh, it generates heat, and heat is a big problem. Um, and I like this. I like, I like one of the reasons I like Elite Dangerous is because heat is one of the biggest things you have to deal with, and that's sort of realistic. Um, you don't deal with it in the same ways you would in real life, but uh, it's it just gets across how much of a problem heat is. So, like on the International Space Station, um, so we've got our solar panels, but then these guys here, these are all heat radiators. And 
radiators are not something you see in sci-fi a lot, um, maybe because they don't look cool or something, but a, a real spaceship is going to have wings. It's going to have radiators all over it. Uh, because lasers, for instance, are about 20% efficient. So that means 80% of the power you put into a laser is going to be wasted as heat. You have to get rid of all of that. And if you have, you know, giant, you know, city-busting lasers, that's a lot of heat to deal with. Um, those nuclear reactors are pumping out heat constantly. So, that, I mean, getting heat out is difficult. And there are, there are concepts for using better heat sinks, um, but at some point you just can't beat thermodynamics. So, so I'm, let me wrap this up real quick and then I'll take questions. So what does a real space battleship look like? Well, the boring answer is A, there aren't any. Um, <laughs> and that might be because of drones and, and missiles and, you know, that's boring. So let's look at if we make some assumptions and come up with a uh, space battleship that might actually exist. Um, this is from a video game, an indie game called Children of the Dead Earth. Uh, it's pretty cool. It, the graphics are a little rough. The interface is not the most intuitive, but it has uh, real physics. Like the rules of this game are programmed with real life equations. And so uh, this is a space battleship that somebody made in the uh, Children of the Dead Earth. Um, you can see the interior here. It's got an interior structure. Uh, with fuel tanks, and uh, it's elongated um, to a point to take advantage of armor sloping. Uh, you can imagine uh, a projectile hitting a sloped surface is going to do less damage than hitting a perpendicular surface. Um, and the whole thing is cylindrical. It's got heat radiators off of it, coming off of it. So. Um, Yeah, it's true. So this is, this is from the trailer for the game. Um, and we'll get some scenes of uh, orbital navigation, so crazy orbits. Those are tracer rounds from uh, rail guns, not laser beams. Um, You'll notice in a lot of cases, you won't even see the impacts, and like suddenly a ship is just spinning off into space. Um, that's probably because a missile is traveling at such high speed that uh, you blink and you miss it. Um, so that's all I have for now, and I just want to give one more shout out. Uh, if you want to know more about space combat, I'm not associated with this guy at all, but uh, this is one of my favorite websites, Atomic Rockets. Uh, it's set up as a resource for writers who want to write realistic science fiction, but it's a great read uh, if you're just interested in uh, aerospace engineering and space physics. Um, and actually, Winchell Chung, who uh, wrote the website. If you remember way back to the beginning, that clip from uh, Mass Effect, uh, Serviceman Chung is a reference to Winchell Chung. Uh, so uh, I'm getting the sign that I have to end the con, or end the uh, presentation, not end the con. So thank you all for coming early in the morning. Enjoy the rest of MAGFest. Uh,